Let's go back in time by 12 years. This little device, an iPod, a third generation iPod, along with the iTunes music store that was launched with it, transformed the music industry forever. It also changed my life in two fundamental ways. First, like probably many of you, it allowed me to carry my entire music library with me all the time, everywhere. And that was very good, because at that time, I was doing a two-hour commute almost every day. So being able to search and find any song of my entire catalog of music was amazing. Now, my fascination with this device went beyond its new functionality. It was something else, what was making my touching it, browsing for music, and holding it and carrying it, something special. What was it? Was it the technology that this thing had? Not enough. There was something else about it. What was it? Yes, it's design. And, um, and that is, when you look at this box, and the powerful combination of technology and design that this box had, no wonder why the iPod family became the undisputable leader in the MP3 uh, player marketplace. And that led to another fundamental change of myself as an academic, as an academic that does research on innovation. And uh, it sort of made me realize that if design is so important, then we should do something about it. We should actually build science behind design. And that's what I want to share with you today. I want to show you how important design has become in the creation of innovative products like this one. And therefore, how critical it is to measure and analyze very seriously the role that design can play in innovation. That's what I want to talk about. Now, what do I do as an academic? Well, I'm interested in the management of innovation. I'm interested in how innovation happens. And in the past, I was actually studying how products like this one, like an aircraft engine, were put together so that we could find better ways to design complex products like this. Now, in the last decade or so, I got more interested in other type of products, products that are actually quite distinct to that engine that I'll show you in one particular thing. These products are not only fantastic pieces of technology, they are also fantastic pieces of design. And, and that's why interacting with these products is, is, is sort of like a different experience. Design makes the interaction with these products very different. Now think about it. Think about your favorite product or service. And think about what makes that product or service special to you. Is it the technology that is inside it? Or is it the design and the way you interact with it? I bet it's the latter one. And so if design is so important, well, how can we measure it? Isn't design is just about aesthetics? It cannot be just about aesthetics. It's actually way beyond aesthetics. Design is about finding, discovering what truly matters to you, the end user. And then, iteratively, finding novel combinations of form and function that results in innovative experiences that makes interacting with these type of products very special, with your favorite products very special. And, um, but now, again, how can we measure that? How can we measure aesthetics? How can we measure design? How can we measure the collaboration between the people that put together these designs? How can we measure the amount of investment that is the companies that create this have put on design and see if that actually pays off? These are important questions that we need to address if we really want to manage design properly in the years to come. And, and that's what we wanted to do. And so how do we get started? How do we get started about finding what's new on something like this? Well, one way to look at this is by looking at patents. Why? Because patents document a novel idea so that we can protect the people and companies that come up with new ideas. So if this is a truly new product, well, there should be a few patents associated with it. So that's what I started doing. So I actually started looking for the patents associated with my iPod. And something interesting happened. 
I found many patterns that describe precisely the technologies, the components, the functionality that explains how this thing works. And that was interesting. Actually, those patterns are called utility patterns. That's the category of patterns that explains how something works. Now, when doing this, I found a different type of pattern. And it was a pattern that didn't describe how this works. It basically described how it looks. Not only the iPod, but also the accessories, the, the docking station, the case holder. And again, they only describe the look rather than the functionality of it. And these type of patterns are called design patterns. There are different type of patterns. And when you go inside it, you can actually see uh, what, is, what is any design pattern. By the way, they are all public documents. And what is common among all the design patterns is that they have only one claim. They basically document how a product looks. In this case, the ornamental design for a media device. Followed by, of course, a bunch of sketches, illustration, drawings that, again, explains how something looks, not how it works. And if you search for design patterns across many product categories, this is what you find. You don't find how they work, you find how they look. And that's actually quite interesting information for somebody that is interesting about design because we not only find the drawings, but also the, the designers that come up with this and the companies where they were created and everything. And there are quite a few of them. Just in the US alone, in the last 35 years, they have granted more than 400,000 pat pat design patents. Almost half a million design patents out there, just on design. And that's actually a fantastic database. If you really want to measure and say something seriously and quantitative about design, here you have a fantastic body of data for that. Now, here's something interesting. We haven't found anybody in the management community, in the academic community, that has used that body of knowledge about design to say something about the role of design in innovation. And that's why we got so excited. Once we realized about this, we put together a great group of collaborators that decided to build science behind design. So I'm working closely with another uh, uh, professor here at INSEAD, Jorgen Mim, and also three doctoral students that are working with us. Uh, Tian Chan, Hai Bo Liu, who just graduated also, and Christoph Penetier. And together, we are trying to discover fundamental truths about design so that we can better learn how to better manage that in the future. So what I would like to do now is to give you three mini stories about what we're learning while doing this. And the first story is about design. What makes a design a good design? Why are certain designs become trend settings and, and trigger styles, while other designs just follow and, and, and imitate? So, so what's the style? Let's build our intuition behind this. And for that, let's go back again to the MP3 players industry. If we go back to the year 2000, this is how MP3 players look like. Until October 2001, when the first iPod was launched. After that, something interesting happened. All the MP3 players in the industry start sharing the same design language. They start all looking very similar. And that's what we call styles. Styles are a group of objects, of designs, that are perceived to be visually similar. Now, given that, you might wonder, well, can you identify the styles in that huge database of design patterns that you just collected? And the answer is yes. We have developed a methodology that combines clustering algorithms and, and experimental validation to basically identify all the main styles in the thousands of design patterns that we have. And just to illustrate how this works, let me show you uh, a few drawings from design patterns from the telecommunications product category. Each of them, actually, you can find them in a design pattern. And uh, applying our methodology, we can actually group them based on the visual similarity that they trigger. And we can actually see that those groups, those clusters that we call styles, are actually quite similar within the style and different across. 
So we have the classic handsets, we have the candy bar styles, we have the clamshell styles, we have the, the slates. And here is something cool about this. We know the timestamp of each of these designs. We know when each of these design patterns were granted. And therefore, we can actually see the evolution over time of the styles. So for these four styles, this is how they have changed over time. But again, we have done this for all the styles that are embedded in our design database. And something that we learned about this is that we have learned that on average, it has become increasingly difficult to predict what's gonna be the hottest next style. Looking at the classic handset was not gonna give you the, the formula to predict that the candy bars were gonna be the next hot style. And looking at the candy bars was not gonna help you to predict that the clamshells were gonna be styles, the hot styles. And that difficulty becomes even more accentuated when there is no technology in the category that you're playing. So think about furniture and fashion. And that is a challenge that managers need to wrestle with when they are creating new form, when they are creating new designs. So we need to build that capability in our organizations to deal with new, this new source of uncertainty that is becoming increasingly present in the industry. Now, let me go to the second story. That story, this new story is not about design, it's actually about designers. There are 200,000 unique designers in our database. So you might wonder, who are the most influential designers in that? We can actually identify those systematically. And guess what? The usual suspects that we consider very influential designers appear in our database as influential designers. We call them design gurus. And once you identify that systematically, then you can ask, well, would the designers that collaborate with these design gurus become better designers? That's an interesting question, if I know who collaborates with whom. Actually, we can find that out, because when you look at a design pattern, you know who actually worked together to create that pattern. So in this case, Johnny and I worked with 10 other designers and, and colleagues to create the design of my iPod. We can actually find that out for the entire design industry. And what we learned is that if you, as a designer, work with a design guru, indeed you become a better designer. You become more productive as a designer, and, that, and you get more attention from the engineering and design community about the work that you produce, even if you do that work with a guru or without a guru. Even more, if you work with a designer, the probability that you become a, 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 a guru, if you work with a design guru, the probability that you become a guru yourself in the future more than doubles. And that is particularly true if the network of collaboration around the guru is very cohesive. Otherwise, you actually don't, lose, don't use the full potential of collaborating with, with a design guru, which is actually quite important for companies that are considering bringing a design, an influential designer in the house. That led me to the third story that I wanna share with you, which is about companies. Would companies that invest in design get a financial return by doing so? This is a, a tricky question, and we are working on it. Our, actually, our results are preliminary, but are interesting nonetheless. So, so let me share that with you. We start again with the patents. In this case, we start with design patents and utility patents. And what we look for here are the names of the companies that get assigned a patent. And then we combine that information with financial information about those companies that is available in other public databases. So we built an even bigger database. And in that, we then look for the companies that have a constant record of patenting both in utility and design so that we can determine what we call the design utility ratio is for a given company, how much design patents you have over the number of utility patents that, that you get in a given year. And then relate that to some financial measures of that company. And guess what? On average, after the late 90s, that design utility ratio is associated with higher uh, sales and higher profits. So investing on patenting in design 
seems to be paying off, especially in, in, in the late 90s, after the late 90s. So what have we learned with all this? If there is one punchline that I want to leave with you today, is that design can be measured, can be analyzed very rigorously, especially if you pay attention to this fantastic uh, uh, design patent database that is out there and that we're working uh, together to create some insights about the role that design plays in innovation. And we are learning quite a few things about this. We have learned how designs emerge and evolve over time and how they are actually becoming increasingly difficult to predict on a, their, uh, what the next style, hot style is gonna be. We have, lear we have learned about the conditions, the collaborative conditions that need to be present around a design guru to be able to become a better designer by working with them. And we have also learned that those companies that invest on creating design capabilities are actually getting some financial returns by doing so. Just to finish, I think it's becoming clearer that design is gonna be one of the most influential disciplines in business in the year to come. So we better know how to, how to manage that. We better learn how to create the knowledge to do so. And I think what we're doing here is to outline a path that is gonna help us to create that knowledge that we need to effectively manage design in the years to come. So that the development of an innovative product like this iPod it's not a rare event, but it becomes more the norm around the world across many industries. Thank you very much.